Well, good morning, Cornerstone. It is so good to see you today. My name is Pastor Greg, and Christmas is right around the corner. We are wrapping up today our series on the symbols of Christmas. We've talked about the manger, we've talked about the star, we've talked about the angels, and today we're going to talk about the gifts. Um, now, I have a Santa hat on today. When I was a kid, um, we had this tradition in our family when the family came, whoever delivered the presents to the people on the circle got to wear the Santa hat. So I thought, hey, talk about presents, let's wear the Santa hat. But really, <laughs> I really have another reason for wearing the Santa hat. The, re the, the reality is that COVID's going on pretty strong right now, and I can't get a haircut without endangering my family to COVID. So my hair is, is a complete mess and out of control. So I just thought if I could wear a hat today, things would just be a little bit better for all of us. So, so there we go. Um, hey, before we get into the Word of God today in the message, let's take a time uh, to come before God and to humble ourselves and to pray. So would you join me? God, we thank you for uh, this season that we call Christmas, Lord. We thank you that uh, this really is the greatest celebration of the entire cosmos is the birth of, um, Lord, is your birth because it's amazing that you would love us and you come as a little child. So Lord, we celebrate you, we thank you on this day, and Father, we pray that you would help us to meditate well and to remember what this season is about. And as the angels said, they had a message of good news and great joy for all the people. We pray that your joy would conquer anything else going on this season, that even in our trials, God, that we would experience your joy and your peace and your presence. God, thank you that you know everything people are going through that are listening right now. And Lord, just pray that you be with them and bless them and speak to them even in this time. So we pray this in your name, Jesus. God's people said, amen. All right, so as I said, the symbol for today that we're gonna talk about are the gifts. And so I'm surrounded by gifts this morning. Um, I'm at my mother-in-law's house right now and I actually just kind of walked in here and I'm pretty excited. I have one of these presents actually has my name on it. I have no idea what it is, but I am excited to open it. But we have something more important to get to than the opening presents. It's to talk about the tradition of gift giving. Uh, the tradition of gift giving has been going on for a really long time, even uh, long before the time and the legend of Santa Claus. But the tradition of gift giving goes back to the Christmas story itself. Now, in our Christmas stories we've been talking about for the last few weeks, multiple people had a chance to visit baby Jesus. We had the shepherds and we had the magi that we talked about. And one of the great things about the Christmas story is that God goes out of his way to let people know who the Christmas story is for. So when the angels show up and they sing to the shepherds, uh, and they make the announcement. They tell the shepherds, hey, listen, unto you, there's a Savior is going to be born. And this Savior is going to be good news that brings great joy to all people. Not just this will be good news for some people, or this will be good news for most people, but the angels are convinced when they give the message from God, this is a message of joy for all people, for all people for the righteous, for the wicked, for the Democrats, for the Republicans, for those who made it, for those who don't make it, for those who made a mess of their lives, for those who are doing okay, for those who don't know where the next meal is gonna come from, to those who are super wealthy, whoever you are, God says the message of Christmas is good news that will bring great joy for you. And of course, sometimes we hear that and we know, of course, it's good news for me. I can stomach that. But some people in their life experience, it's hard for them to stomach good news of this sort. That's why God brought shepherds into the scene. Because remember, shepherds were the unclean trade. And shepherds typically weren't invited to religious festivals and celebrations because they were unclean. But when Jesus comes to this earth, he invites the shepherds to come to his place where he was born. That's God's way of saying, hey, my message is for everyone, especially the people who feel like they are on the outside. And this other group uh, we had were, were the Magi. See, Jesus was born as the Jewish Messiah. Of course, we learned that his, he's not just Messiah for the Jews, but for the whole world. But what happens is, instead of bringing you know Jews to come in and celebrate Jesus, God 
brings Gentiles to come and celebrate Jesus, people who are on the outside of the Jewish faith. And so the Magi are sent, um, we talked about like the star in the sky that led them, which like quick aside, by the way, after I preached that sermon, a couple of you sent me some messages. We talked about there's different theories for the star, and one of them is the planet alignment theory that says Saturn and Jupiter came together. And I believe it's uh, Jupiter being the, the royal or kingly planet, and Saturn being the planet of the Jews, when that came together, the Magi saw in the heavens a sign that a special baby, king of the Jews, was being born. That happens very rarely. The last time it happened was about 800 years ago. But the next time it's going to happen is actually tomorrow night. And so um, it's going to be really special. I, we're going to go out there and pray that it's going to be clear sky. But the, the people in the news say that we should be able to see these two uh, planets coming together uh, tomorrow evening. So who knows, maybe the world's going to end, or maybe Jesus is going to come back, or something really special is going to happen. Probably not, but it will still be really cool and a really neat reminder of the presence of God. So anyways, back to the story of the Magi. So the Magi have traveled probably from the region of Arabia, and they traveled many, many miles to see baby Jesus. And what is so unique about the Magi is not only that they came from so far to see a foreign baby boy king being born, but it's really neat to see how they responded to baby Jesus because their response becomes the model for our response for Christmas and what we should do with our time during Christmas. So I'm going to open up the scriptures here. I have no, no PowerPoint today. We're going old school and normal. You know, we're going to bust out a Bible, which is great. I hope that you're staying in your word during COVID. Um, and what I want to do, I want to read to you the story after the Magi had gotten to see baby Jesus, and I just want us to see exactly what they did. You probably know, but it's always good to hear what the Word of God says. It says, um, the Magi went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. When they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. So, question, what was it that the Magi did when they saw baby Jesus? Now, you can say they did two things, but I think they maybe did one thing in two different ways. Here's what they did ultimately. When they came to this baby boy, to baby Jesus, really the king of the world, the scriptures say that they bowed down and they worshipped him. Now, what does it mean to worship? My favorite way to think about what it means to worship is to worship something is to put that something on display for everyone to see or to acknowledge and exalt the value of whatever that thing is. So I was thinking it this way. If I want to, maybe I have this really awesome picture that I think is so special and so beautiful and I want everyone to see it. I put that picture on a prominent place in the wall. I light it up. I bring attention to that picture. See, that's kind of what worship is. It brings attention to the beauty and the greatness of that thing that we're bringing attention to. And so they've come to worship baby Jesus. So what are they doing? Well, they're bowing down with their posture. They're acknowledging the lordship and the kingship of this baby. And who does, I, I expect kind of how we worship, they were probably saying things of praise and they were probably talking in gratitude about this baby, but they were worshiping this baby. Now, the second thing that they did, which is still a part of actual worship, is the scriptures say that they brought an offering or they brought gifts to this baby. You know, I would say that this is actually a part of our worship, right? Because when I bring something of value and I give it to God as an offering, it is one way that I express how valuable God is to me. And so these gifts were a way for them to express how valuable and special they thought this baby child was. So we have gold, we have frankincense, and we have myrrh. Now, why did they bring these particular gifts? Well, let's talk about what these gifts are first. Okay, so you have gold. We all know what gold is. It's a precious metal. It's been a precious metal for many, many years. It's very valuable. So they brought gold, and then they brought frankincense, um, frankincense came from a tree usually harvested in Arabia. Basically, 
the sap would come out, they'd dry it, and then they would burn the beads of sap or the resin uh, to make an incense. And actually, myrrh was similar to Myrrh was also harvested from a tree. It could be burned as incense, but usually myrrh was used in anointing oils, often used in religious uh, settings and things like that. Sometimes myrrh was even used to help healing of wounds. So we have gold, we have frankincense, and we have myrrh. So the great question, what I think when I read this, is why in the world, what's so special about gold and frankincense and myrrh? Well, I think depending on who you asked, you would get a different answer to that question. I imagine if you went to the Magi and you said, hey Magi, why'd you bring gold and frankincense and myrrh? I suspect they'd probably look at you and simply say, well, because that's what you bring when a king is born. You see, when you look at the ancient records and you see um, gifts that were brought to newborn kings, Often, gold and frankincense and myrrh, sometimes all three, were a part of the gifts given to royalty. And gold, frankincense, and myrrh are all gifts that could be harvested from Arabia. So I would suspect if you asked the Magi, why would you bring the gifts? They would say something like, well, of course, we're going to see a king and this is what we have from our country. So we're bringing these gifts to baby Jesus. Now, these gifts are gold. We know gold is valuable, but we also know that frankincense and myrrh were also very costly things as well. So the Magi brought a costly gift to honor a baby king. Now, if you ask this question, what about the gold, frankincense, and myrrh to perhaps um, some of the early Christians in the first 500 years of the church, you would actually get other answers. You see, what's really interesting if you read some of the history and, and how the early Christians in the first 500 years of the church thought about some of the stories and scriptures, they often saw them in highly symbolic forms. And so when they looked back at the three gifts, a lot of Christian writers from different traditions would kind of speculate and meditate, well, what could these gifts symbolize? So gold, typically across the board, was simply seen as a very valuable gift fit for a king. And so when they thought about what the gold represent, they said it represented the kingship of Jesus, right? This baby boy being born as a king, but not just an earthly king, but a heavenly king who now sits on the throne and is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, frankincense had all sorts of ideas connected to it. But frankincense um, was often used in connection to, um, to, to divinity. It was used in um, when you burn incense for prayer. And it was used often even in the Jewish temple. Some of the writers speculated that as incense represented, or as frankincense represented divinity, is uh, that it would represent the prophet Jesus. And so sometimes they would look at the frankincense and be like, this is to symbolize Jesus as a prophet. And for others, they talked about how the frankincense simply represented Jesus as being divine. And then you have myrrh. Now, myrrh is really interesting because myrrh had a lot of uses. Myrrh also uh, was used in the worship of deity. Um, it was often used in the anointing of priests. And so sometimes ancient writers would talk about how the myrrh was representative of Jesus being a priest, right? And so maybe you've heard this before, that Jesus is a king, a prophet, and a priest. And so sometimes writers would talk about how these three gifts would symbolize those three aspects of Christ. Now, other writers... Uh, when we talk about myrrh, see, myrrh was often used in, like, for the sick when they had wounds to be healed. And so some people talked about how Jesus was given myrrh because he would be the great healer, right? I mean, Jesus literally does heal physical diseases, and he healed people in his day. But even further than that, Jesus heals our souls, right? Because when we put our trust in Jesus and we choose to follow him, he makes us white as snow and he makes us new people and he heals the brokenness that is inside of us. Or some people have even talked about um, myrrh was often used in, uh, in burial. So they've talked about how the myrrh would represent the death of Jesus Christ and the suffering that he would go through. So there's a lot of cool things that these particular gifts could symbolize. Now, I imagine if you ask Mary and Joseph, you get a very different response from them. Like, why gold and frankincense and myrrh? You see, 
Imagine for a second, remember who Mary and Joseph are. They're poor Jewish peasants who've traveled far from home. Like, they don't have a ton of resources to get around and do what they need to do. But do you remember where the Christmas story goes? After Jesus is born, they have to flee and go to Egypt because King Herod is going to try to kill baby Jesus. But how in the world does a poor Jewish couple able to travel and live in Egypt having almost nothing? Well, I think these gifts were the very reason they were able to do it. I mean, to make that travel and to live in Egypt for at least a year, the gold and the frankincense and myrrh, I imagine, were used by Joseph and Mary to pay their expenses so they could do what God asked them to do. For them, the gifts were very practical, and they were a gift from God. And, it, and in this story, it's just an example that when God asks you to do something, God will always be faithful and provide you exactly what you need to do, what he has asked you to do. And he did that in the case of Mary and Joseph. So, these offerings, I, the way we can look at these offerings really, to me, help me understand and remember what Christmas is really about. You see, I, I love gift giving. I like, gift, I like gift receiving too, right? There's something special when I give a gift to my children or to my wife or somebody that I care about. To see their joy when they open the gift always does something warm inside of my heart. You see, when I give them that gift, it's, it's not just that I'm giving them a present, but I'm showing them how much I love them. And they too, as they receive that present from me, are receiving the love that I have for them. And their joy in receiving is a blessing to me as I give them that gift. See, gift giving is a beautiful thing, but at the end of the day, what is the ultimate example of the Magi? Well, the best way to respond to the story of Christmas is to, to do exactly what they did and offer our gifts to Jesus. I mean, why do we do this? Well, because he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And when there's something in our lives so special and so beautiful, like worship, we want to lift that thing up for the world to see. And so we give our offerings to Jesus just because we love him and he's so valuable. And we just want to express to him how much we love you, Jesus. Because what Jesus has done for us is infinite. I mean, we can never give what Jesus has given to us. But when we turn around and we give back to him, we show him how much we appreciate it. And we affirm that he is everything that he has claimed to be. He is Lord. He is Savior. He is the King of Kings. He's mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace. And so we give gifts to him. And we do it in different ways, right? I mean, part of it, you know, we bring an offering to church and we bring him our gifts. Um, we bring gifts to him every time we serve somebody or we, you know, uh, we support ministries in Turlock or however we give of ourselves to other people. Ultimately, we are giving ourselves to Jesus. And one of the things when I really think about the gift from the, the point of view of Mary and Joseph, at the end of the day, um, when, when the Magi gave the gift to Jesus, what were they doing? They were participating in the work of God. They probably didn't even know it at the time, but by being generous towards Jesus, God used their gift to further his mission. This is one of the things that we get to do when we give our gifts to Jesus. Now, sometimes I've, I've thought about this before, right? Um, I, have, I have often wondered, um, like, why does God set up the world the way he does? I mean, he's God. He could do anything he wants. Like, like, if he wanted to, he could literally appear right now in person to every human being on planet Earth and say, hey, you've got it right or you've got it wrong. I am Jesus. I love you. Worship me. Like, he could totally do that. In any minute, Jesus could show up and, 
He can heal my wife. He can heal my daughter. He can heal those who are sick. He can just show up and he can do these things. Now granted, someday he's going to do all those things and he will heal the world and he will rule on high. The scriptures say that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But in the meantime, Jesus has actually allowed us to do the ministry and the work that he will do in full some day. It's like he doesn't want us to miss out. He, he wants us to participate with him. Why? I don't know. I think probably because he simply likes being with us. So Christmas is a time to remember, hey, I can participate with God by being generous with what I have as I give of myself to others. So, Christmas. We're going to celebrate in a few days, and I'm praying that no matter what's going on in this season, that you experience the presence of Jesus. And I know in, in many of you will receive presents. Many of you will give presents. But I just want to remind you and encourage you, this is the season, first of all, to give to Jesus. And so, I think maybe a good response to this sermon this week as we come to Christmas is I want you just to think about how you can make an offering to Jesus and how you can celebrate his birth by your life. You can do that in so many ways. I mean, on one hand, it's it's also reframing your perspective a little bit. Like, I'm giving a present to my child, but ultimately, why do I give a present to my child? I love my child. I want to see my child laugh and love and be full of joy, but ultimately, I'm giving of myself because that's what Jesus is like. So even as I give a present to my child, I still say, Jesus, I do this in honor of you because you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So sometimes uh, it's reframing our perspective and realizing that as we give of ourselves to our family and our friends and others and people who aren't our friends, right? As we give of ourselves, we're ultimately doing it for Jesus. But also sometimes Jesus invites us to step outside of our norm and to be generous to the people around us. So maybe there's a way that, um, maybe there's a person or a neighbor or somebody at school or there's a need you see on Facebook, but there's some way that Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to serve me. I want you to, to give me a gift by serving somebody else that I love. So maybe, maybe that's what Jesus is asking you to do. But hey, I'm not Jesus, I'm Pastor Dre. And so uh, don't listen to me. I invite you for Christmas. Make sure just when you're done with this sermon, sometime today or tomorrow, step away and be silent and just sit in his presence and say, Jesus, is there anything you're asking me to do to respond and to celebrate your birth? Hey, it's been so good to be with you. I'm praying for a great time of celebration for Christmas. And we look forward to seeing you on the other side of this. Um, God is so good. And it has been so good to, to serve alongside of you in this church. And we just love you so much. So may God go with you, may God bless you, and let me pray for you this morning. God, we love you. Um, we thank you so much for the ultimate gift of Christmas that you gave You gave of yourself. You, you became a child. You lived and you got through adolescence and you got through the teenage years and then you ministered and you ultimately laid down your life on a cross so we can be forgiven and free. Thank you, Jesus, for that wonderful gift. We pray the joy of the season would overwhelm our souls. I even just pray that you bring tears of joy to us this season. And Jesus, we want to respond to you. And so we just show, pray that you show us how to continue to offer ourselves on your, uh, for your sake to the world and the people around us. Pray this in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen.